Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Chris Lubkeman. I am Head of Foresight at ETH Zurich, and I'm very happy to welcome you to today's lecture, No Time to Waste. The ETH Global Lecture Series offers a platform for contemporary global topics to be discussed with outstanding global thinkers. Each month, we bring two amazing people together to discuss their personal insights, experiences, and expertise. In addition to simply learning, which I love to do, our goals are to broaden our perspectives of contemporary issues so that we can all broaden our own thinking, challenge our opinions, and through this, to make a meaningful contribution to issues which we are all confronted with. Today is Climate Day here in Switzerland. And I'm especially pleased to be able to host this conversation with two very passionate individuals. We have Sage Lanier, lecturer at UC Berkeley, whose course Solutions for a Sustainable and Just Future is in very high demand. She's also currently teaching with Zero Waste USA and working on turning her curriculum into a book. Her discussion partner this evening is Philippe Bloch a full professor at the Institute of Technology with in, excuse me, the Institute of Technology in Architecture at ETH Zurich. Following the motto, Strength Through Geometry, the Block Research Group applies research into practice on the design and engineering of novel shell structures, developing computational structural design strategies, utilizing digital fabrication and pushing construction innovation to address the grand challenges posed by climate change. Essentially, his research group just does really cool stuff. Our time together will be about 60 minutes. I will start our dialogue with our two guests, and then I ask you, our audience, to please pop questions into the Q&A, and I will peruse them as we go through and integrate them into our conversation. And I'll remind you a couple of times during our hour together. So please pop some questions in and then we'll get them to both Sage and to Philippe. So are we ready? All right. So, so Sage, no time to waste. That's the title of this evening's dialogue. What does that mean to you? And you're on mute at the moment. Hi, Chris. Hey. Um, what does that mean to me? What a great question to start things off. Um, I mean, I guess it's just, we do have a ticking clock, but I, there's also not a hard deadline. I kind of like to really formulate things and or frame things in my own mind as like, there will never be a point where it is too late. There are always going to be more people on this planet. There's, you know, in 2100, 2500, probably even in the year 3000, there's going to be people on this planet and the actions that we make today, the decisions we make today are going to be the de deciding factor between whether those people are able to navigate our, the changing climate that we put them in, you know? So that's kind of what I, that's the framework I use for understanding. It's never going to be too late, but it is urgent. Hmm. And so tell, tell our audience a bit more about what it is you do. Because I, I gave a kind of a really like a two sentence descriptor, but mm -hmm. you do what you do is pretty cool. So why don't you could you share that, please? So I do something a bit novel. Um, so basically, my work in education starts with um, so UC Berkeley, where I was an undergraduate, I just graduated, um, offers students the ability to teach their, to teach mini courses to their own peers usually for like one credit or two credits and usually these are really fun topics like knitting or Kanye West or Harry <laughs> Potter um, but they can also be really serious um, there's yeah. like some there are some really really hard courses on like Chinese um, ancient medicine and like you know ethnobotany and all these different topics so I wanted um, to teach something and I didn't exactly know what initially, but I was kind of like, okay, I feel like the environmental education we're getting from the professors is extremely negative. It's always focused on the problem, understanding hmm. the problem, how bad it is. Very rarely do we actually discuss um, what our next steps are. And my, my 
you know, me and all of my um, peers are, are becoming depressed from this coursework and we don't want to give up because it's important, but like, it just feels like there's no hope in sight. So mm -hmm. I was seeking solutions really. So my education work is something I'm technically not qualified to do, but um, love doing anyways. And I think the work speaks for itself. So I've taught this class, personally, I ta I've taught it to about 700 people. And then I also have a teaching team now at Berkeley who's had an additional, I think, three or 400 students now since I've graduated. So it's been taught to over a thousand people in just a couple of years, which is pretty exciting. Um, and it's kind of like a crash course. Everything we can do to save the planet, it's really, really solutions focused, but we get in a lot of different topics. We do climate change and decarbonization. We have three weeks on food systems and like food justice and, you know, who um, access and equity in the food system. And there's a lot in there, but we also do like circular economy and cradle cradle design and um, uh, green chemistry and waste and the, um, all these kinds of different topics. So that's a general synopsis. I've started to do other forms of education work since. Yeah. Well, that's really great. So I, I was going to ask you what you started to, get into a little bit more about what is it that you taught and what was it because I love your optimism and I'm one of those who who spends you know two days a week being a bit depressed about what's happening and uh, and you probably spend half a half an hour a, a week right <laughs> zero right perfect I never this is think awesome. about it. yeah I never so, think about like oh god it's like I just don't because I'm like there's work to do there's things to be done right and I mean my work is really in like I figured that education was the most impactful place uh, I could be so that we could just have more people aware of these different solutions and able to enact them in their careers and whatnot. So I'm not directly on the like, there's work to do side, but I do have, like my students do tell me afterwards, like this, I'm going to do something differently with my, you know, biology degree or my business degree because of this mm -hmm. class. I'm like, well, there, the, the work's being done. Yeah, that's really cool. So what, what would you say was that, that but did you have like an epiphany moment or did you just just build up to this frustration this guy going oh arr, 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 arr. and then you said i'm gonna do something or was it like it was, -da, you're at the beach one day down near beach and kind of going oh. it was totally an epiphany moment or not it was totally not an epiphany moment it was totally just a frustration um I was a very angry teenager. I started this project when I was 18 and, and like started teaching. When I was 19. Um, and yeah, I just was very, um, I have to say I was, I was extremely angry and also was kind of like looking at my professors who were managing to make the world's most pressing topics sound so boring. And I was like, there was a bit of ego there. I was like, I think I can do this better than you. Um, <laughs> I love it. That's and great. I pr like, like disclaimer, I didn't like my, like if I could, if I could write hand apology notes to my first semester of students, I would. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but it, it happened over time, you know, sure. it, it definitely wasn't a, you know, a, a perfect, you know, everything you need to know from the get-go. And it still yeah. isn't. It's, we're always rewriting this curriculum and we're going to try to turn it into a book soon. Um, but like, it definitely took time. It was a building process for sure. Well, I think that's, you know, there's, it's great to hear how you're saying, you know, every little bit helps, you know, and, 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 and if everyone believes, if you believe in democracy and your vote matters, which I do, then it's the same thing. Every vote, every vote matters. Every time you do an action, you're voting on our future. Mm -hmm. which it's I think it's kind of like you're manifesting that in that way. So I'm going to I'm going to come over to Philippe for a moment. So and you are also very passionate about no time to waste. What what does it what does that mean to you before you comment on other stuff? Yeah, I um uh First of all, uh, kind of indeed refreshing to hear uh Sage's kind of optimism uh because I, I, my, my drive, uh, my time to waste uh, comes together with a bit more anxiety, in fact. And because I think it, it's, it probably needs to come from both sides. It's true that everything matters, and, but there is also certain things that just have such large magnitude of impact that, that uh, yeah, it, it, it makes you 
you you you get delusioned uh, by it. So uh, specifically, the field that I operate in, uh, building and construction, has such a gigantic impact as a single field, um, an impact that I think uh, is not really. Uh, still not really public knowledge sufficiently in my in my opinion uh it helped that bill and melinda gates in their annual letter in 2019 kind of shared their surprise about the impact of building materials but uh considering that uh, construction uh, buildings uh, are responsible to um, when i teach then i try to make it simple so that uh, things stick and uh, the simple message is 40 40 40 uh, one more, 40. Uh, so um, global global levels, uh, construction buildings uh, uh, consume about 40% of, of energy, uh, are responsible for 40% of global waste, 40% of uh, resource consumption. And what's problematic is that most, uh, these are virgin materials. So these are uh, things that we just scrape from our beautiful planet. And then last but not least, and that is a little bit more known, is of course the, the emissions associated, so the pollution that comes from this industry. And uh, so um, Sage was talking about uh, angry, disappointed. Uh, I indeed was also angry when I heard these numbers, when I learned about this, and I was wondering where, where all of that uh, knowledge or this, this, this responsibility that we are asked for why was I never told this before? Or maybe I didn't pay attention, or maybe it was just not on the agenda. And so once you know this, I mean, I, I don't know, I cannot let it go. And so that comes with a, a level of anxiety because the no time to waste, obviously it's very beautiful that waste is in there as well. But um, uh, all the scenarios that predict what we need to do to control an, an, that point of no return with respect to global warming, um, demands immediate action and immediate action at a scale that matters, right? So I, I mean, I do agree with everything that Sage sets and, and it's never too late, but um, there is big things we need to do better. And, and so for me, for me, um, uh, yes, I am a naively optimist person, as you know me, uh, uh, Chris, but, uh, yes, sure. but that, that has to come from a drive because uh, it's a gloomy, uh, it's a gloomy outlook in a way. Yeah. So let's. I want to stay on this topic just for a few more minutes before we talk about some of your research. And and so, I'm actually quite intrigued by this idea that once you have seen something, you can no longer unsee it. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, for yep. you, Philippe, as you're saying, like all this when you realize that, um, you didn't, you didn't quite say it. You felt like you were being lied to, or something was being hidden from you. You didn't say that. No, it's yeah. it's it's exactly like that, and and um, like once you are aware um, how inefficient structures are, and that uh, structures are so floor plates in buildings, in 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 high rises or any floor plate, that those are the most polluting kind of things in 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 construction. Uh, once you know that, then you wonder why no one ever has attacked this, and and if you then learn more about kind of the mechanisms behind it, then you learn that actually. This has to do with um, economy, with, with also ease of construction, with um, uh, people have done 100 tests of a system that is kind of absurd and doesn't make sense, but they don't feel like doing all these other laboratory tests to develop new building codes and regulations and so on. So there's all these inhibitions uh, that, that you start to kind of learn about why people are very, uh, very, uh, very, um, averse to, to, to kind of uh, change, then you also learn that unlike other industries that there is no margin or practically no margin for profit so that no one can even afford to take a risk or a leap or to take responsibility in doing something else. And so all of that together, I didn't want to start necessarily entirely mm -hmm. gloomy and, and, and depressed here, but all of this together, there's quite a lot of inhibition to actually do something. And, and and so, uh, but it's necessary. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. we, we all need to contribute. And so it's absolutely. Uh, well, I hear that. And it sounds like, you know, I'm going to interpret what you're saying. It's like there are a lot of closed doors. Like you see, there's a lot of things like you wish you could open doors and say, let's, well, let's just, let's go down this door for a while, but that's closed. Yeah. And Sage, it sounds like you've been, this is something you've been doing, like to seeing the, 
again, that's this theme of seeing the, when you've seen something, you can no longer unsee it. How is that with your with your students? Is, I mean, this must be something which you love when you all just see their eyes going, uh, wow, we can do something, right? Or, I mean, how, how do you? For me, for me. Pardon? You. Or, okay, for me. You um, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's the most, that's definitely a, the most gratifying, you know, part of it, because that's why you try to teach, you know, that's why you yeah. try to educate. I personally don't even like education. Um, I find public speaking to be extremely anxiety inducing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's always a challenge, you know, but and it's always also just bizarre that other folks can like form an opinion of you. And you, they, they just carry that around and you don't know what it is, you know? But it is the most gratifying thing to, co to come to the end of a semester or to receive feedback and whatnot. And you see people are saying like, this changed my life. This changed my perspective. I took this information to my community, to my family. Um, we're doing things differently. I'm starting this organization. I'm starting this initiative. That is, you know, the payoff. That's the only reason I'm, I get up there and do it. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure Philippe can say the same. Yeah, I'm sure. But let me before you go before you go to Philippe, I want to come back to you for just a second and say, so is this idea of closed doors? Like Philippe is a bit frustrated because within the construction industry, there are lots of closed doors, like the the closed door of lack of profit, the closed door of it's we just don't do it that way. What are some of the closed doors you've seen, or with some of the teaching you've done, or some of the students uh, at the university? This where that, and I love the fact I love your optimism, but there must be a few times you kind of go, come on. Yeah. 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 Um, the most frustrating thing for me was um, attempting to convince school administration of the need for some kind of um, requirement along the lines mm. of the mm. environment and environmental solutions, most specifically. But you know, I was like, we like. We are, it is just baffling to me to be like, we, to be standing in front of like chancellors and people who can make these decisions and be like, we are literally entering an ecological crisis. The school is so proud of all of their computer science research and their business school and all of that. None of that will be possible if these, and it was just baffling to me that, you know, I was just mm. getting a bunch of no's, like a bunch of, we don't have the resources for that, you know. And simultaneously, you know, they're thanking you for bringing you like good, bringing them good press and headlines and whatnot, even though they were the same folks to stand at, you know, to, to try closing doors. And I was like, can I, can I have, can I have a bigger classroom next year? And they're like, that's not allowed. And I was like, please, please. <laughs> and like, <laughs> went back and just really like knocked on so many doors and irritated so many people that they were like, fine. Okay. You can have a bigger classroom. Like, leave me alone. Um, and well, you know, well and then, and then you, and then you get a, a new article, like some press coverage and they're like, ah, oh, student that's activism, so... student leadership. That's what Berkeley's all about. And I was like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, I think your students are lucky that you were so stubborn and we all are, and this is what we need. I think this stubbornness to just keep, keep pushing, I think. And, and, and Philippe, for you, it's this sort of keep pushing. Where do you? Where do you see some of those little those little doors beginning to open? Are you seeing doors beginning to open, uh, or is it just like still is your head still hurting? No, no, no. I, I mean uh, slowly, but uh, yes, I think we have at least a toe in between in in the door. But uh, no, things things are moving, and I'm hopeful indeed. I mean, it's not uh, um, we have to keep pushing, and and that's actually uh, quite an interesting. Uh, situation that we're in and particularly at ETH that it does demand some discipline and some persistence and some not giving up and also if one is very uh, honest and straightforward a lot of funding to just keep keep pushing uh, concepts forward and and mm -hmm. and I think that's that's really that's that's the only thing that I'm a bit frustrated about that is that our industry doesn't have such mechanisms so in in, in the phar pharmacology, they have this because it's worth it. It's worth it to burn billions because if you find that medicine that, that saves the mm. entire world, then mm. you will get it all back. Mm. Uh, the, same, uh, the same in the automobile. You, you can still innovate and so on, but you, uh, that, that, that opportunity is not, not here. And so 
that's where you sometimes feel a little bit lonely. But um, but I do see a, a big change. I, I, I see I see willingness, uh, but. When push comes to shove, I mean, then then the real things that matter uh, always come back, right? And then people uh, get nervous. Uh, finances are uh, not as crystal clear as as when you do something that you've done already a thousand times, and so on and so on. So I'm I'm not blaming blaming anyone. In the beginning, I thought, and and I I think that's maybe part of this ivory tower kind of business. Then you feel like ha, ah, practice industry. They don't understand. They don't get it. That's what I, I started to learn. They, they absolutely get it. They just are themselves kind of in this, in this straight jacket. And so I really wonder what it, what, what it is that, that will offer us to break through that. And, and last time we spoke, Chris, I, I, I went even more doom-like doom, doom uh, and I said, well, if we, if we hit some sort of uh, Armageddon or Mad Max kind of situations, then people will will have to respond, right? So hopefully we, we don't get to that point. Yeah. Uh, it would also be sad if, if change can only be pushed if this is imposed by regulations and by new tax laws and so on. But, uh, but yeah, uh, so far it seems that that's, that is what's happening, that where, where change is happening, uh, that actually in regions in the world, so t- I, I recognize two, two, uh, two regions where t- change is happening. Uh, one is where regulations, so the wealthier countries like Switzerland or, or uh, also France and, and in the UK, they have uh, more and more stringent, stringent kind of uh, CO2 um, mm-hmm. uh, requirements, emission equi- uh, requirements. And where I also see kind of things happening is in, in, in the global south, in, in developing contexts where I'm, I'm lucky to work in South Africa. In Kenya, we are now teaming up with uh, in India. And why I mention these things is because the attitude is very different. Yeah. They, start from, uh, from, they start from a need. They start from a reality that, that, that they don't have anything and they just need to get the best. And, and, yeah. and in my field, that often goes together. If you do something with less resources, with more humble resources, really getting the most out of absolutely nothing, even garbage. Uh, so building with garbage or building with grown materials and so on. Um, they're used to that. They're used to turn anything into something valuable. And, mm-hmm. and, and working in such a context is so, so refreshing. And, and, and they're not stuck in the same straitjacket. And so sometimes I wish that, 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 that we would learn from them, from learning again like... The master builders in the past to 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 design appropriately with the constraints with materials like if you have a if you have a, a stone then that stone wants to be an arch because that stone wants to be in compression uh, that stone doesn't want to be flying somewhere in the air because it's cool uh, and, and and things like that right so so we used to have much more restraint when we built and so I'm convinced we have to go back to that uh, but what will it take on our end in our part of the world to get to that point, how can we get burst through that straight jacket, through this kind of uh, money is the only thing that matters. I mean, yes, there is good intent, but often that good intent goes together with some strategic kind of uh, ideas behind it, or it's an image kind of opportunity and so on and so on. I mean, for me, I, I also learned to be opportunistic. Whatever it takes to have people do something good, good for me. But we need to do it at such a large scale. That what, what is that mechanism? That is that's my key question somehow. And Sage, do you have any advice for Philippe on that? No, it's a serious question because you have you have really, I love the way you've been able to galvanize through your passion, and now you've you've done this for a couple of years. You saw some of the the challenges whatever it takes to make it work what are, what do you what does that, I don't what does that necessarily, say to you? right i don't necessarily know if i have advice for philippe because we're dealing with a very different set of um, barriers you know mine are, mine are very much just the barriers of the institution or you know well, we've always done things this way but philippe has some serious like financial and like material constraints that i'm just like have never been put up against. And Mm -hmm. um, I must say like in this very specific time period we're in, I do have the privilege of leveraging like 
this new rush to listen to youth voices or to POC voices or what have you. And I just kind of am like, well, I have something to say, so I'm going to exploit your <laughs> desire to do that. Whatever um, it takes, right? Whatever it takes. Right. But obviously that is a completely different set of constraints than what Philippe is working with and just the overall lack of funding in um, architecture and in city planning to like enact these initiatives. This is something that we, I do, I have studied a, a bit, no one as much as like, um, but you know, it is, it is cool to see it happening in action in, across America, but there's a little bit more, particularly in like the Bay Area or San Francisco, there's a little more of a, of a desire to put money into that kind of research and the extra cost that it's going to take on to make that, make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, but actually, I think you might, we, we might be closer to having impact than, than you might think, because I think you, uh, you mentioned something important and something that I was absolutely surprised about. It's the power of actually young people speaking up indeed. Um, and I say this in a very specific context, because I have, um, uh, I have many colleagues that are successful. They're all around 50, 55 and, and, and so on. And they, uh, many of them have uh, kids in, in high school or uh, uh, still in elementary school and they come home and uh, they come home from one of these klima strikes or this climate uh, kind of uh, strikes and, and, and protests and so on. And uh, it's a little bit like parents becoming vegetarians because their kids are vegetarian. It's, it's a similar thing. It's a, such a powerful kind of... Uh, Kind of message, and and I have I have people in charge of big, big engineering offices, for example, good friends of mine that say, "Ha, huh, if this would have been a year or even two years ago, I would have posted this project everywhere and and kind of uh, rolled my my arms and 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 said like, look at what we've done and how amazing, what an engineering feat and so on." And he said, like, I, I am, I'm, I'm not, I, I cannot even look, look back at this project because uh, why did we do this? Why was it necessary to not have any columns in between this and this? This cost X amount of more material and so on and so on. So I think there is something uh, fundamentally powerful uh, or, or very powerful about what you say. It's, it's actually to, uh, to raise the awareness, to increase the pressure. And I think that's something not to be underestimated as well uh, i mean we have one very famous uh, uh one that that has been very uh, effective at this of course mm -hmm. i agree i think that um that cultural change is so key i mean where i have the, like so in the city of berkeley it also happens to be a very politically active space and to me it was just baffling and very exciting when you know i'm like I, I made friends with all these other activists and all these different spaces and they'd be like so do you guys want to um get burritos for dinner and go down to city the city hall meeting and i'd be like what's the, why did we go to the city hall meeting and they're like to yell at the mayor he put up this really <laughs> stupid proposal and we started doing that like a, on a regular basis and just participating in our local community politics and i knew so many students who were doing that and who were involved in like commissions and had like positions or were on committees or what, what have you. And, um, you know, because, and I do believe it very much was, I mean, it, it very much was because of the just like urgency and persistence of just the citizens of Berkeley and no matter what age they were, we have some of the most progressive laws in the country. I mean, there's the zero waste ordinance that is the most comprehensive plastic bill that's ever been passed in the United States. They just ended single family zoning, which is a huge deal in terms of city planning. Um, so you can, you, they're no longer allowed to require that an entire space be only, you know, single family homes. They have to incorporate um, businesses and coffee shops and what have you into those neighborhoods and build high rises and stuff. And so that's wonderful. Um, so yeah, like, like these changes are enacted by having a very persistent and active um, population. So a lot of the work that I do is simply trying to convince people of their own impact and agency, because so often we say like, oh, like one person can make a difference. And usually we're kind of saying that in regards to the individual environmental actions you can take. And while I do think that is important, you know, to try to use less plastic or eat less meat or what have you, I think what that speaks to more so is the impact you can have by starting a campaign or getting involved in your local city council, the impact that one person can have on 
an entire city or an entire county or state, you know, and then the, 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 um, what is what's that word? Just the, um, res- resounding effects of that mm-hmm. when you spark that the amplification um, yes and, and yeah. you get other people and across yeah. the world i think that we need that so, push towards local politics so, really and i think that's what people are looking for as like how to enact change so that's a change to do bring up two words that to me they're really crucial or, or key not crucial they are crucial but also key one is agency and participation that as you said, it's really for you to help the students, your 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 comrades, if you will, understand they have agency, right? And this is something for all of us. Every citizen has agency, no matter what political system you're in. You have agency through what you purchase, or how you purchase, or how you behave, right? This is one aspect, and the other aspect, as you said, is the participation. And I loved your little burritos down to yell to mayor. Um, and this idea of uh, the more we participate around the world and, and as we can, the more active we become, the more movement. So it's, and this I think is, is really interesting to, to see. And so Philip, I want to ask you this idea of agency and participation within within Switzerland, right? And then and we'll come back, we'll, we'll, we'll pop up back up to your research, but these two words, what do they mean for you? Or do you see within across ETH or across the the, the country? I'm just, I'm just I'm just curious, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, there, there. The words are a little bit abstract to me, so I'll, I'll try to I'll try to. Uh, hopefully, my answer or my response is kind of in the line of what you're trying to ask. Yeah. But. Um, uh, participation, I, I, it needs to be more than than in the academic realm. So participation needs to involve all the the, the people that matter, all the all the relevant stakeholders. So the clients, the builders, the the people on in the field. And uh, um, yeah, for me, uh, I mean, it's there. And actually, again, we are a bit in a bubble in in in, in Switzerland. Uh, we have. Uh, significantly uh, easier building codes or ways to deal with building codes than in the rest of Europe. Uh, and that, that allows us actually to, to go on an adventure with people. So it, it offers, it gives us a good framework, uh, but uh, yeah, we're just not going fast enough. It's, mm-hmm. it's just not enough. It's too, it's too um, prototypical. It's too punctual. It's too kind of, uh, um, it's too, it, it, it then also becomes almost anecdotal and mm-hmm. so it's uh, uh, mm-hmm. but it's also it's it's everything is related it's really crazy I, I, I came into into this actually quite positive and now I, I'm noticing I'm, I'm pretty gloomy here but um, <laughs> uh, it's also for example the academic kind of uh, the academic uh, uh, context I mean you are expected to do something unique something fundamental something in order to be able to publish it and to go forward. I mean, this this uh, iterative, like doing the hard last 15%, which is the one that really matters, right? It's not the one that gets you on the cover of Wired magazine or into 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 uh, yeah, go viral on social media, but that's, yeah. that's actually what really matters. So there's so many things that are against having an impact. And uh, mm. I... Um, Chris, I, I'm, I don't know if that's allowed, but I saw in the, in the Q&A a question that really has been bugging me uh, uh, sure. the entire time. Well, I want to, is it okay to quickly react to this? You uh, are welcome to react to it. Okay, I was going to yeah, bring so, that in later, but dude, yeah. you take it. No, it's just I made the mistake of reading it. And, and there is a very, <laughs> there is a very, there is a very fair, fair, fair question and a, a blunt well, question not... somehow. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I guess maybe almost a provocation, like what. What, what have I done or what can I do? What have I achieved to kind of, um, to kind of uh, give hope to young architects uh, that just come out of their education and that are being confronted indeed with all these, uh, these, these, these closed doors that I've been talking about. And mm-hmm. um, so, because that is, also, that is also reality. And maybe I, I will not directly answer it because I'm sure you'll find a way to to have us answer that question in one of one or the other way, Chris. But um, 
I want to maybe tell a little anecdote of a personal crisis that I had. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, so our group was very much, the research was very much en vogue and was everyone wanted me to give a lecture and to show our pavilions and fancy stuff and everyone was fascinated, students loved it and so on and so on. At a certain point, I realized, what am I doing? I'm telling all these things that, that are so specific that we have developed in our little bubble through kind of accumulation of very specific knowledge. So what I'm showing is, is cool, suggests that it could be a solution, but no one can do anything with this. And so it's a bit mm. related to this question. I got so frustrated and actually almost disgusted with myself that I was actually selling um, a, a, a bubble, a lie, not a lie. I mean, it's my reality, but it's a, uh, uh, it's kind of, it's not a real solution. And, and that is where uh, Tom and I, I lead my group with Tom, uh, where we somehow dramatically decided, like, let's not be tempted anymore by what gets you easy attention, by kind of like this, uh, what gets you invited to lectures, what, what gets you into magazines and so on. But let's, let's, let's step back and really do this last 15%, this non-sexy 15% that actually you cannot publish because it's not novel. It's actually the same as what you have already done, but you need to keep working on these things. So, and, and we started to kind of try to have impact and no longer travel the world and giving lectures and giving hope to people while actually not really offering any, anything. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a really weird situation. And it's kind of a, it's a, um, so to, to, to the question that was asked, like, what, I'm, mm -hmm. what am I doing? Well, by stepping back, by actually realizing, uh, so it didn't take you to ask me this question, but uh, by realizing that actually um, this is giving an outlook, but a fake outlook that we had to do it ourselves. Yeah. That is now what we're doing. And we are on the brink of breaking through. But um, so to give one example, we have developed with our research group um, a, an, an alternative for a, a reinforced concrete floor plate, 80% of the world is being built in concrete. Uh, so urbanization is driven by concrete construction. And we developed this floor plate by reintroducing ideas of the Gothic master builders. And that allowed us to uh, only need one third of the, of the concrete volume and one tenth of the reinforcement steel. And so this is, this is really disruptive. This is really making a difference. And, and so, uh, this was a principle 10 years ago, then we did prototypes, then we stood with uh, uh, one and a half tons of ETH nerds on a very thin floor plate <laughs> to really convince that we, to show that we believe in what we do. And, and, and now we just realized the first project here in Switzerland, in a real project, we, we built one of these floors. And now we're talking uh, with, with industry partners to bring it to the next le level and to commercialize it. So, but I already gave a hint there, uh, thanks Sage, but I already gave yeah. a hint there that it took us 10 years. It yeah. took us 10 years of really absurd measures and distances to kind of to, to demonstrate that by reintroduce old principles that we should trust because these beautiful Gothic cathedrals are still standing around us but somehow, because it's not part of modern engineering knowledge, um, it's being dealt with with a lot of skepticism. And, and this cannot be, aren't we at the pinnacle on, of knowledge? I mean, uh, th this is old stuff. This is not relevant. Mm -hmm. But guess what? If you reintroduce the old stuff, you can really change things. And so that is my passion. And, and, and this, this, it is very rewarding now to be at that point. So, But I have to then, again, so that's why this question bugged me, is that... Um, so much disciplined, continued persistence to try to, and what have we achieved? Yes, one building. And maybe also, okay, maybe another building in South Africa. So two buildings we have achieved with this principle. And that's also, that's but, where I'm coming from, that yeah. it takes such such yeah. an effort to, to get there. Yeah. But do you know, Philippe, someone told me once, you know how you run a marathon? You have to take a first step. Yeah, there you go. Right? And I think, and you have to, and it sounds like you're on a marathon. And I think we all are on a marathon. And this yeah. is where you, know, you have to believe that we'll get to it. And this is why I think, Sage, with your your optimism there, it's just great to think, hey, we we can run this. You can say, you got, we got this, right? And all of us, it takes all of us, it takes a village to make that marathon work. 
I want to come to something else that's in that question, but it's also kind of noodling around in my head as we talked about participation and agency, which is our belief that through our actions, we can actually make a difference. The other part to that, the trilogy, is that the education or the knowledge and so the information and the knowledge and the data information, knowledge, wisdom. But so in both in both of your work, to what degree did you find that the the data, the information, the knowledge was there? And to what degree is it is it still missing? And and was it was it to hand or did you just have to dig it out literally or figuratively or stage what for you with that? Sure. Um, yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, to me, you know, I haven't, I have not yet done any original research. Like this mm -hmm. um, effort of mine is really a curation, but the curation mm -hmm. is the work of years and many people. It's, um, I basically had to craft my degree around this initiative that mm -hmm. I, like this little project of mine, I took an interdisciplinary degree purely so that I could um, go to all of these different corners of the university, all these different colleges within the university, and try to get a grasp on all of these different topics like business and like decarbonization and city planning. So I spent a lot of time in the School of Environmental Design and in the business school and in engineering and um, really just trying to understand like what the hell was going on because each of these disciplines was only offering you know, maybe a handful of courses on the environmental impacts of their entire discipline. Hmm. And I was just taking those courses hmm. and I was taking two or three courses just to try to be like, okay, so what do you all think is the direction that your discipline could go in hmm. to fit into, you know, a more sustainable vision for, for our future. Um, and then, you know, pulling that, curating that, and it was the work of years. And that was just the most frustrating thing for me was that um, we don't have solution-centered conversations, first of all, and that the information is not easy to find. You know, I was in a university, one of the top environmental pr programs in the world, um, and I had to go to, you know, like seven or eight different corners just to gather all this information together, and I just felt like it should be more accessible. So that's that was kind of like the, okay, this should be more accessible. And now with these lectures where we're like, okay, um, because, you know, you get freshmen, you get seniors, you get uh, graduate students in the class, and they have varying levels of interest or varying levels of knowledge of what they want to do. So we go, okay, so if you enjoyed this lecture, you can take these courses. <laughs> I, took, <laughs> I took them and I enjoyed them yeah. and I learned a lot. Um, so yeah, like we're just trying to kind of like bring it in and then point people outwards again. And there's a lot of resources that we also supply to accommodate that we made um, these huge database, not databases, but like directories and um, huge, like this huge website full of resources for, you know, living more sustainably or getting involved with this or that, or use these organizations you can join just because, you know, it was so hard to find that information. So I feel like it, it's been the barrier of a lifetime that this information has been pretty um, inaccessible, I would say to the average person, but that's kind of my mission going forward is to bring, you know, these knowledge of these, like architecture impacts us all. We should all have a, you know, a, a robust understanding of what that looks like. And um, at least like what kind of work and challenges architects do or city yeah. planning or what have you. City planning directly impacts your quality of life, you know? Oh, yeah. So I think just kind of like making sure that the average person has access to this information that's directly relevant to them food systems oh my gosh sure. is yeah. probably the mission of my life you know well it's, we need it there and especially the food systems we can reduce the waste and improve etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean seriously that's that's gonna be big you know i don't think half the world knows where their carbohydrates even come from you know how many miles they've traveled how much water was embedded in them or the carbon or the what the nitrates you know it's, it's a massive issue so I wish you really great feel with luck with that. So, Philip, I want to come to you with the same question. With the education knowledge is the, th the third part of this triangle to make change happen. You know, um, within the industry, within the construction industry, do you feel 
like the knowledge is there or is the knowledge not there and 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 is it or is it just not able to be con understood is there a cognitive dissonance like you're looking at it but like i'm looking at it but i don't get it and how do you um yeah this is gonna be uh, th this is going to sound uh, horribly arrogant uh, but uh, i think really knowledge is lacking not knowledge of of uh, how to calculate things how to do things like we always have done it uh, but uh, really knowledge to change it to really fundamentally kind of throw rethink uh, also how we work together but how we design and build our structures um yeah, I, I, I don't think that knowledge is there. And it, it really, mm -hmm. and that, that's, that's another thing, and that relates directly to education, is that it takes a, it takes a while to educate uh, um, not only new knowledge, but more importantly, another attitude. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been lucky to have had an absolutely fantastic, passionate mm -hmm. professor and advisor at MIT. And that's, that's where I got this, this background and this knowledge. And, and um, yeah, so I brought this way of teaching and this way of kind of uh, uh, not just doing whatever, uh, but really uh, be very conscious about your decisions and the relation between your geometries and what it means for the forces in your system. So hence how efficient your structures are. So I, I took this then to my teaching here and I was lucky to find uh, uh, um, uh, someone with the same ambition, Professor Schwartz. And but then I can, I can go on and maybe find two handful of people in the world that I would say that teach in this way and, and, and teach really in a way that allows uh, students and people to kind of uh, uh, yeah, change things and approach things in a fundamentally different way. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, yeah, I think, I think this, this knowledge is missing. And, and it even goes to the extent that uh, another kind of example um, the civil engineering profession has been pushed uh, through the age of the architects. Uh, I hope, I think we are past this time of ego, egotistic behavior in, in architecture. Um, uh, we should all design together and try to come with better solutions. But we have had just the period, the last decades of, of such behavior and, and engineers have more and more been pushed in, in, in just make it happen, say yes or no, will it stand, will it not? And rather than being an active part of the uh, uh, designers, uh, yeah. creators, uh, ingenious people like what is in, in, yeah. in the name of an engineer. And so that means that also uh, that is now the image also of the profession. Yeah. And it means that actually maybe the wrong people are now studying engineering mm. because they assume they do kind, they will kind of do like an accountant job. They will just crunch some numbers. And then at the end of the equation, they will be able to say, is it above a certain value or below? But that is exactly the wrong type of people that so we need we to need, make, yeah. make a change, right? And so, yeah. Um, yeah, there is a lot to it. I mean, mm. and, 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 and all mm. of these different things that I've been mentioning uh, makes our industry so slow adopting. And, and, and for an industry that has so much impact, I mean, we yeah. have to act faster, but yeah. Um. So but I want to come, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this, I'm going to flip it now. Mm -hmm. Both of you have said you're optimists, right? And I'd like to, so in our last, last sort of 10 minutes, I'd like to come back to the, the optimism raft on the, on the river into the future. And I'd like for you if you think out to 2040, right? if we think into the future, I believe it's very important that we have hope and we have intentionality, we have directionality, and we have a, some kind of a picture of how we believe, what we're working towards, the normal, which each of you is trying to create. You're trying to change our understanding of normal. This is what both of you are doing. Yeah. So what do you imagine that new normal could look like or some components of that in say in 20 years time and adding those 20 years to both of your ages or in the world, you know? What, can you give me some vignettes, little tiny pictures of what might that look like, Sage, can you? Sure. Um, to me, I think the most drastic change, at least, um, 
here like in America or in other high income countries is gonna be the, a drastic cultural shift first and foremost towards not valuing overconsumption. Um, I, I am a huge proponent of that kind of like, you know, there's all, there's all this talk about, you know, decarbonization, how do we get to fully renewable energy, da, 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 da. How do we get to fully sustainable um, clothing materials, building materials, et cetera. But the, you know, first and foremost, we need to look at where we can reduce and just eliminate, you know, what is like, how do we lessen the load that we have to translate to a more sustainable version, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be the biggest and most obvious environmental impact that we can have is just that drastic reduction. Um, but obviously that's going to require a complete right reprioritization socially, culturally for us, for those of us who live in countries that are so based on consumption mm -hmm. and where um, your value as a person, your status in society is directly correlated to how much you consume. So I, I kind of envision, you know, like more of this haphazard, but like joyfully chaotic um, way of life that has more to do with community and um, really making sure that everyone has what they need and really um, looking out for your neighbors and that kind of like looking yeah. internally in order to solve these global problems, looking on a local level in order cool. to solve them. So that's kind of my vision. When I yeah. think about 20 years out, it's just, it's very, it's not organized in any way. It's kind of like we get there through stops and starts and through like every like little random way, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And I think I, I like that idea of this de, the defocusing on the more you have, the better you are. It's an interesting. We heard a, a talk from another faculty member, Rachel uh, Garrett, yesterday, actually this morning, from looking at uh, Amazon deforestation and the Amazon and how cattle ranchers have for years been encouraged to deforest by the government. And also that was a point of pride was the more cattle you had rather than saying, how can we make this ecosystem work? This is, but I think both of you are trying to say, how can we evolve the system so it is more robust and more excuse the like the more biodiverse but in, in different ways you know this is i think what i'm hearing from you sage what about so philip what do you think about 2040 what do you see well 2040 in 20 years from now i'll still be teaching at eth so <laughs> i hope with uh, with the same passion as i can do now no so, um, so in in 2040 i think by then uh, something will have happened uh, regulations will have had tightened so much um a real environmental crisis would have happened that made us all change and, and, and act. Mm -hmm. So by 2040, I'll be very happy that uh, uh, all buildings in the world have been built with our floor plates. And <laughs> by doing that, we have reduced in total 50 gigatons of CO2 emissions uh, compared to what we would have done. Uh, no, I'm joking a little bit, but I, I mean, it has to be my ambition or one of these things has to happen because that yeah. is really what needs to happen indeed. Yeah. And, 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 and also uh, to maybe pick up one of the questions also that came in or comments is that um, by then also we would have evolved past the materials, the, the, the toxic, uh, the, the polluting materials that we are using now into more natural materials because these principles that we are introducing of structural geometry and so on allow very weak humble locally sourced materials to be activated as fully yeah. structural materials but in the next 10 years we mm. still will have to go step by step and we still will have to do as as well as we can with the concretes with the steels with the the, the the timbers all the polluting materials that we have right now and, and uh, before we get to that point. In 2040, I'm also convinced that uh, we will be uh, design with constraints. We will design buildings uh, thinking of what we will do at the end of their lifespan. We will mm -hmm. uh, build them for adaptability. We will build them to be taken apart. We will build them to be shredded into uh, non-degraded kind of new building materials and, and so on and so on. So, I'm hopeful uh, because I feel that things are changing, 
I also feel that there was another question that, that triggered is shouldn't we start earlier in high school and so on? I feel that this new generation, and I feel I, I notice it in the first years, the questions that I get in the first by the first year students, they are so critical, they're so to the point, they're so kind of mm -hmm. engaged when it comes to sustainability kind of things and so on. So I think it is exactly something is happening in the high school. Is it is it amongst peers? Is it in the education? Is it just general public awareness is it pe people like sage and greta and so on that are kind of bringing all of these people to more awareness i don't know but something is changing so i'm hopeful that we'll be responsible and respectful designers in 2040 and that we'll have a much better built environment i like that philip i like that well done i seriously that's really wonderful and i think this is absolutely true and i think we see that. I have one very, I want a short answer from both of you. If you would like one thing for everyone to take away from this evening's chat or this morning's chat stage for you, what's the one thing you would like to say, okay, remember this. And Philippe, you look like okay. you've got an answer yes. already. So you're going to get yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, I got an answer. I mean, I, I, I try to clarify it with a 40, 40, 40, 40. Mm -hmm. that the impact of the, the the built environment is is gigantic and so what i want people to take home is that if clients demand new standards if clients really want something different then architects builders have will provide it but so there needs to be that will and so it goes maybe it does go back to what sage said earlier that everyone can contribute so yeah. um you need to ask for it. You need to question. You need to yep. challenge. And so, maybe, maybe uh, just to end on a little bit of a positive note is that that it's uh, um, just let just don't let things be. Just ask for something better. That's there you go. I like that. Don't accept. Don't be complacent. Mm -hmm. Ex expect better. Sage, what about you? The one thing you'd hope for everyone to take away. I feel like I already said it, but um, when you're looking for, as you all are, when you as an individual are looking for what's the biggest impact I can have, look outwardly. You know, I think that the environmental movement at this time is a little bit too focused on the, your own lifestyle changes and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Look outwardly, check out, you know, what initiatives are or not going on in your immediate area and see what you can do to change that locale because ultimately the only success we're going to get is by relocalizing there you go. it has to happen in every city in every yep. municipality across all of the nations in order for us to get there that's great so your city is where you start that's really wonderful you know i think if we if we think back to where we started we started with you said a very angry teenager a very frustrated and angry faculty member went through a whole series of thinking about doors that are open. You can't unsee what you've seen. Once you become aware, you have to act, participate. It's up to each one of us and everything that we do as individuals. It is up to us to act and to make the influences which you both are making in your, your different worlds. And, and, and the cool thing is, it is our world, right? This is, it's not, separate we're all collectively connect together in that so sage thank you for joining us from the west coast very very much philippe thank you for joining us here in this evening you both have been absolutely um inspiring for me and i really mean that sincerely and uh thank you and i also want to thank all of you who have joined us this evening this morning for this uh, global lecture, No Time to Waste. Our next one will be on the 17th of June with a good friend, Enrique Sala, an amazing individual who's an, uh, a National Geographic explorer in residence trying to save our oceans and protect the last little bits which have not been ravished. And Loic Pellissier, a faculty member here at the ETH, doing amazingly cool things with looking at actually DNA in water and tracking biodiversity through the DNA. 
It's very cool. Both of them amazing individuals as they were this evening. So I look forward to seeing you on the 17th and Guten Nacht miteinander.